Coming up on Digital Music Trends 129, we talk about Twitter music, Groove Shark, music in China, the Daft Punk Spotify record, Psy's YouTube records, and Royalty Exchange. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, uh, the weekly show where we discuss the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available on most platforms including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, uh, Stitcher, as well as most uh, podcatchers. So this week uh, it's a packed show and I'm happy to welcome back some great great guests, uh, starting with uh, Ben Cesario from the New York Times. So hi Ben and uh, thanks for joining us once again. How's it going? Good. Great. And me. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. And uh, also Elliot Van Buskirke from Evolver.fm. So hi Elliot and it's great to have you back. Hello, thanks. Great. Awesome. Well, uh, today I think we have to start rolling with the uh, story of the, the week. Really, it's, it's, it kind of took over, uh, I think, everyone's Twitter feeds uh, and social media feeds uh, last week. And it's the launch of the Twitter Music app. So uh, that was, uh, you know, the story started, appear, started to appear about a month ago or maybe six weeks ago when uh, the first reports started to come out that uh, We Are Hunted, the social music uh, discovery app, had been uh, acquired uh, by Twitter and sort of the, the rumor continued to grow and there were some potential release dates thrown around uh, and actually the, the rollout was a little bit slower than, than, than everyone thought. You know, they gave it first to, you know, A-listers and uh, musicians and influencers first and then it got rolled out to everybody else. And you can find it as an iOS app and on music.twitter.com. Uh, I think it's uh, present in seven territories right now. So uh, first of all, I want to hear your thoughts. You know, there's been a bunch of reviews around uh, on people that were disappointed, people that like it, uh, kind of uh, contrasting opinions. Uh, so, uh, Elliot, well, what's your take on Twitter music? Um, well, I, I like it because I liked, uh, I think I was the first person to write about We Are Hunted um, when I was at Wired. I think this was 2009. Um, I called it this fantastic new way to discover music. And um, the article actually did really well. I, don't, I think it was um, just the image of seeing all of that music tiled with play buttons. Yeah. Um, you know, my... My feeling is that um, even people who know how to do complicated things with computers don't like to. Um, and so anything that makes it that simple to, um, you know, the way that We Are Hunted sort of looked at the whole internet, including Twitter, Twitter, and just spat it out in this easy to digest thing where you're like, you know, a monkey could figure out how to click on those images. Yeah. Um, and I think that that design element is great. And now they're focusing all of their data scraping on Twitter. And uh, it seems like a pretty natural fit. I, I really like the design too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had the same experience. I, I uh, We Are Hunted was the first company I ever interviewed on this show back in April 2009. So it was a show number two, I think. Uh, we yeah, had Nick, so... Nick Crocker on. It was a week after they launched. Uh, so that's uh, that's been a while. Uh, I've, I've known the yeah. company for a while as well. And so uh, where's our where's our Twitter stock? Is my question. You know. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, ben, well, what's your take? Um, well, I agree that um, We Are Hunted, you know, was a, was a um, very attractive interface and it was a good idea. Um, I just wonder what it's going to do on Twitter and, and, and really what people on Twitter will use that for, if anything. I mean, there, there definitely was, you know, a few days of um, poking around and experimentation and we were all finding our favorite band and saying, now playing, but... Um, I was just scanning through the last couple of days, and a lot of this has really trailed off. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, Ryan Seacrest, who they gave early access to, I checked, and um, his last post having anything to do with this was several days ago, where yeah. he said, hey guys, what do you think about the new Twitter music app? Um, so I think the idea that people, first of all, will be using the app uh, on their phones means that they're going to leave Twitter and go to another separate app that really has nothing to do with Twitter, um, or that they'll be on their computer, oh, you know, on their computer, um, and going back and forth to that Discover tab. Um, I just think that just doesn't sound like the um, cool, simple, you know, Twitter that that I know. Um, yeah. And I, I also think. Um, we're just flooded with kind of music discovery and with tools that scrape the internet and recommend things to us. So I think this has a real hurdle about proving that um, its discovery will be better, you know, its push and discovery will be better than everybody else's discovery. Um, I do think it's good that it, you know, it 
one thing that I think is really important about it is that it it it, uh, it makes it easier just to put music on Twitter. Yeah. You know, the the embedding in tweets um, is good. And it was interesting that SoundCloud was not part of this. Um, exactly. I think they I think they probably will be. Is you know, is my my guess, my understanding. Um, but when you know, I don't know, sooner or later, it, it'll happen. But um, I guess bottom line, the discovery doesn't really mean much to me, but the functionality of the embedding, I think, is promising. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, also joining us today, we have uh, Andy Malt from CMU, and he's just joined us. Uh, but, uh, so, Andy, we were just talking about the interfaces that actually integrated with the Twitter music, and uh, talking about how, you know, uh, um, SoundCloud missing was kind of a weird thing, considering that it'd been rumored to be one of the launch partners of the service. So, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, something like SoundCloud, it, it seems really important for a service like this just because so much of the music shared on Twitter is stuff that isn't out yet, isn't available on services like iTunes or yeah. Spotify. Um, so that automatically means all of that stuff is missing. Um, and that's kind of the music that I would discover via Twitter. So, yeah, it is a strange thing. That and YouTube have really seemed really odd to launch without. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, audio, I had a, b a bit of a crew actually uh, entering, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, t t t t partnership, of, you know, with uh, with uh, Twitter Music, with uh, Spotify and iTunes, uh, and Spotify arguably being a lot, a lot, having a much wider adoption in, the, in North America. Uh, ben, what's your take on audio being part of that, and uh, you know, uh, rather than you know another similar service or, or Rhapsody, for example? Well, you know, I mean, a lot of people are also part of Facebook music when they announce. So I, I think it's good that they have many services on there. They have several services and I hope that they get SoundCloud and they get YouTube. Um, I think it, you're, you're right. I mean, it's it's good for RDO. I think it's interesting how RDO has lasted. They have, you know, their Skype founders money. Um, you know, nobody, nobody has their numbers, yeah. um, so we don't know exactly how they're doing. Um, but they've survived, and I think that their their technology uh, and, and the design is quite good. So I think that they, you know, um, a year and a half ago, it looked like, well, maybe they're just going to get instantly blown out of the water by Spotify, but that has not happened. So yeah. um, it's a good sign. Um, I do think, though, that the, the fact that um, everybody is now getting more into streaming music and subscription and everything means that there probably will be more difficulties like this where there'll be competing um, interests. There's, you know, there's less reason for YouTube to be on this. There's less, there's less reason for others because they might be doing something like this themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's another interesting aspect here, which is, um, so if you go into Spotify right now, the We Are Hunted app is still live, yeah. and, and it still looks at the entire internet. So it's interesting to, um, to see, you know, to look at the Twitter one right side by side with the uh, Spotify version of exactly the same thing. I mean, they're the same charts, popular and emerging, um, the same two main charts, and it's a totally different set of music. So you can really see what happens when uh, the We Are Hunted engine starts looking only at Twitter. Um, and I'm sure that, uh, and actually my post about this was liked by a former We Are Hunted employee, so I think I'm onto something. Um, so, uh, I think that, I feel like Twitter probably wanted to update that We Are Hunted app, which it owns, <laughs> and yeah. have it be called the Twitter Music app and have it have the same charts. But if you look at, um, you know, Spotify and Facebook have a lot of common investors and board members. Um, so it's kind of looks like it's setting up to be, um, you know, Spotify and Facebook. And then, you know, I think, I think that's why RDO um, is, seems to be, could be the one that aligns with Twitter. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, I'm interested to see how long that We Are Hunted app is gonna, is gonna stay in the old form and, um, whether Twitter will have any luck rebranding that as a Twitter app, even though you know Spotify is besties with Facebook. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and uh, I guess you know the, the, it's an interesting point there to, to look at the difference between the two services, just because uh, Darren Hemmings on his uh, sort of Daily Digest uh, newsletter pointed out that, uh, for example, the Daft Punk uh, track uh, track was not trending at all uh, on the on the Twitter uh, music app. It wasn't even uh, you know registering. And uh, sort of, we had a bit of a back and forth on Twitter, uh, and, and I mentioned the fact that actually the, the 
the band is not on uh, Twitter or they are, but they haven't really posted anything in years and they don't have uh, a big following on, on there. So, uh, so it was interesting because then we had a reply from Stephen Phillips, who's uh, um, one of the, the guys that were haunted uh, in uh, San Francisco now. And uh, he mentioned the fact that because the band is not on Twitter, then of course he wasn't registering. At the same time though, because We Are Hunted was uh, really based on semantics and had a lot of a lot of the work they did was uh, was a sort of early stage work on semantics. It seems weird that the app is not registering a band just because it's not uh, on Twitter properly as as a handle. I don't know, Andy. What's it? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean that's an obvious flaw of something yeah. that has been well something that's been all over Twitter, not just the internet. Like you know that that track went went everywhere, and if it's not showing up in Twitter's dedicated app for that, then it, it really throws up a huge flaw straight off. I mean, I guess it was just unlucky for them because uh, Daft Punk, I guess, is probably one of the only major acts that doesn't yeah. have a relatively active Twitter account. And so I guess it was just a, a bad luck that it, the track came out in the same week that the, the Twitter app was released. But it did highlight a problem with it. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, they'll, they'll probably fix that kind of stuff uh, relatively soon. Yeah, there, I think there's a chicken and egg problem going on with uh, Twitter Music too, where you know people really need to use it in order for it to get really good. And <laughs> this could be—I guess it's kind of a cold start issue. You know, yeah. if it becomes something that everybody uses, then Daft Punk would be crazy not to have more of a presence there. So it'll be interesting to see um, whether the chicken and the egg can sort of appear at the same time as has to happen. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And uh, I mean, uh, and the cool thing about Twitter Music that I think people were excited about the week before it came out was the fact that because it, it can aggregate different services, it could act a, as as one one of the only places online, that, uh, at least the only mainstream place online where you can find an aggregated uh, selection of music where you can cross uh, cross from one service to the other, and and the links would still work, I guess, uh, or the dimensions would still work. Um, and the only only other app really to do that extensively is, is Tomahawk at the moment, uh, also based in, in New York. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm only hopeful that we can, we're going to see more of those integrations where you can actually jump from one service to the other. Uh, that would be great. And, and Elliot, you, you know the guys at Tomahawk pretty well as well, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so. I'm it's, a big fan of it. Um, I, I love it for, uh, I've been using it to embed playlists now because, um, you know, I used to do the Spotify playlist. So if somebody doesn't have it, it doesn't work. And um, Tomahawk, you know, pulls from SoundCloud, YouTube, everything. I mean, it seems like maybe Twitter should should maybe look at that too. Yeah. As long yeah. as they're in the mood to start buying stuff. Yeah, we do exactly <laughs> the same on CMU as well. Yeah. yeah. yeah if I could, if I could just say, I, I just sort of uh, there's a psychological aspect to to this and to a lot of the others <laughs> that um, I think is interesting, which is like the constant ranking. Um, and um, you know the, the the listing of what's popular sorted in various different ways being the way to tell you here's something to listen to um, because you're you're either going to say well I I need to listen to that because everybody else is listening to it or it's immediately going to look wrong to you yeah. so you're going to see it and you're going to say well you know it's it's recommending these 25 people for me but why does it not know that I've already listened to them 25 times in the last three months. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I think this is also a generational thing. I think I feel like, um, I don't know, I'm getting, I'm getting less interested in this kind of stuff as I, as I get older. I'm just like, you know, I, I want to see what's there, but I don't necessarily um, want to see as a way to discover music, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen, down, down to a hundred. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I also, I think, like I discover a lot of new music through Twitter. Um, it is kind of one of my music discovery apps, if you want to call it that. And uh, but I discovered that because people are recommending stuff and they're saying this, you know, you should listen to this, and here's why. Right, a particular now, person. Yeah, and now the now Twitter's given me an app that that strips all that out and just says these are the things that are popular. Mm -hmm. And in fact, like last week when they launched uh, one of the tracks highest up on their emerging artists was the track that had been uh, at number one in the UK for two weeks. So it's kind of I felt like that should be popular rather than emerging. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's some fine tuning to do on that front. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, trying to move on uh, from Twitter, because of course we could go on forever about it. I mean, there's so many issues uh, around how people use Twitter as well that, that, that are going to come into play in the next few weeks. But, I mean, I think at this point we, we can just sort of wait and see how much 
this app is going to actually affect affect our feed, and if people are going to keep using it after after the first sort of couple of weeks of excitement. Uh, but uh, another startup that is not doing so well um, is uh, GrooveShark. Uh, they suffered a major court loss in the running uh, in the long running case against uh, that, that Universal brought against them actually back in 2011. So uh, the lawsuit was filed uh, by Universal. Uh, for uh, the recordings that were uh, released uh, by the label uh, bef uh, before uh, 1972, which are not subject to the DMCA regulation. So basically that means that uh, any track that was uh, distributed by Groove Shark and that was released uh, before 1972 uh, uh, was basically infringing on uh, on Universal's copyright. And uh, after a first ruling last year that was in favor of uh, actually Groove Shark, which is a, a major win for them, the uh, the retrial or, or the, you know, the appeal uh, went in favor of Universal, which uh, becomes a, a major problem for Groove Shark because, you know, of course, they're being uh, uh, attack left, right, and center, and uh, and you know one wonders how long they're going to be able to keep going uh, like this. And uh, in fact, uh, just a couple of hours I think before uh, this came out, uh, Groove Shark CEO Sam Tarantino released an interview on Mashable, uh, which outlined the fact that the company was uh, kind of having a, a hard time, and he was admitting of being broke and paying himself only a 60k salary, having to cut back on staff and cut back on on locations and, and all of that. So, uh, so. Uh, in light of this, uh, what, what do you think of Grushark uh, and uh, where is the company heading and can it be salvaged? Uh, I don't know, Elliot, uh, what, what's your take? Um, well, I spent some time with Sam last year in the in the Grushark offices, um, I think sort of right by Penn Station. Um, and I showed up and he was playing a guitar, um, just, you know, supposedly coincidentally or something. But it was pretty clear that he was he was trying to make a point, you know, that that he's that he plays music and and you know the inference I guess is that he is that there's some respect for for the artist there. Um, to me, uh, Group Shark made more sense when there weren't as many licensed music services. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like you know for when when there wasn't any legal option, um, I was I was sort of more in their corner. And now that there are all these other companies that are managing to pay um, what the labels and, and, and sort of publishers and that whole infrastructure requires, it makes less sense to me that Groove Shark keeps beating the same drum about uh, how music has to be f recorded, music has to be free, because there are other examples where um, <laughs> that's very clearly not the case. And uh, I guess they had a license from EMI for a while, but you know, pretty much there's no music on there that's supposed to be there. I mean, 99.9, .9, as many nines as you want, um, percent of the music, probably people don't want it to be on Groove Shark. Um, I had lunch with them, and one of the Groove Shark people said something interesting, um, which is that uh, they, they are very careful to keep the Beatles music off of there. And um, that sort of pokes a hole in their DMCA safe harbor argument. If they can do that for the Beatles, why can't they do that for my brother's band, Javelin, whose album just came out? <laughs> Good one. You did it. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and uh, Ben, uh, what are your thoughts on Groove Shark? Do you think a company is going to be able to survive this year, and, and, and how is it going to work? Well, they've been playing with fire. I mean, that was it's been obvious for years. Um, it's worth pointing out, though, that this is only one of the lawsuits that they're facing. Um, you know, this pertained to the pre-1972 recordings. Being liable for infringement on those is very bad. They can suffer a lot of damages, which would probably be ruinous, um, as they've been for many other services. But there's also the issue of post-1972 recordings. Um, and, you know, the DMCA is is just a is a legal thicket. I mean, it's, it's, it's very tricky. And as we've seen with the Viacom and YouTube case, it's gone back and forth. Um, and, you know, there's no clarity on it. And I, I wonder, you know, will it be Groove Shark who takes it to the Supreme Court um, to get some kind of definitive ruling about what safe harbor means? Um, I mean, the background to the, the pre-1972 part of this is the MP3 Tunes case, um, which was uh, Michael Robertson's uh, uh, latest digital music service. Um, he got sued by EMI, and there was a footnote um, in the judge's ruling about MP3 tunes, um, which in just a, a few lines said, uh, by the way, the DMCA does apply to pre-1972 recordings. Um, and then it was explained in another, in another court, and now this is a higher court overturning that. Yeah. Um, but it could go further. 
So, you know, the DMCA um, is such an important law that really underpins, you know, everything um, uh, that happens with media online. And so I think, you know, if whether you're on the content side or whether you're on the technology side, you need clarification about this. And that's, you know, that's something that, that the courts um, need to do. Yeah, yeah. And the, Andy, uh, Grushak went from being a, 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 you know, a very small company. I, th I remember back in... I can't remember when it was. It must have been like 20, 2009, 2010. I remember them having a tiny little sort of circular stand in uh, in a medium. Actually, I think there were a couple of people there, and I, I was still trying to wrap my head around what they were actually doing. Uh, uh, and and since then they've grown so much and they, they, they're still adding uh, supposedly like from an article that I read from back in December I think they were adding still 200,000 people a month as, as users uh, so what happens uh, if a company like this gets into trouble and, and where do you think the users may end up from there? I mean I guess uh, from the well from, from the, uh, the from universal point of view they want to go to Anywhere else, <laughs> um, so like obviously like something like Spotify is obviously the of obvious course. destination. But I think with this, I mean, Groove Shark obviously it has grown, and they have they still you know say they have aspirations to be a licensed service and uh, and, uh, and kind of be legitimate, um, regardless of whether they consider themselves that or not already. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think the case is just I mean the, the pre nineteen seventy two ruling and technicality is just a kind of it's a thing it's just a thing that universal can go for the same as emi did with mp3 tunes it's they've decided they don't want this service to exist yeah. and they have a lot more money uh, to draw on and we'll just keep going until it was the same thing that happened to limewire limewire had aspirations to become a legitimate service but the, mm. the labels weren't interested yeah. they just decided this is going to go and we'll just carry on until it does and but isn't that that's yeah. also a fig leaf, right? I mean, it's it's easy for a service that uh, is seen as infringing to say, "Oh, you know, we have ambitions to be legitimate, and don't yes. worry, we're we're working on it." Yeah. Um, and as you said, you know, uh, LimeWire tried it, didn't work for them. Groove Shark tried it, hasn't worked for them either. I, I think the record labels are far beyond the "we'll take your word for it." Uh, just one, one more thing on uh, uh, Groove Shark is the fact that they actually mentioned a new feature that uh, Andy was uh, was saying uh, just a second ago that uh, the company is still uh, hoping to be able to get some license deals done, and they launched a new broadcast feature which allows uh, for any playlist by any user to become. Uh, a broadcasting station essentially uh, which allows them to multiply of course the number of stations that they have and uh, puts them into sort of a Pandora-ish uh, territory which would make licensing a little bit easier but at this point is there too much bad blood uh, with the rights holders to get that done even if it uh, ends up falling under the compulsory license scheme uh, any takers on that? I think that it's going to be very tough for them to do anything yeah. um, and you know they're, they're, they're trying um, but, uh, I mean, they face so much liability um, with what they've already um, done with their business that unless they're able to get, uh, you know, um, several court rulings in their favor at this, at this point, I, I think they're, they're facing a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah it's going to be tough. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, entering a st internet, ra uh, internet radio market uh, requires them to generate probably a lot more revenue than they are uh, right now. I don't know how much they're generating, but it, it's an expensive business, especially if you go into the compulsory license model. Uh, it, it can ramp up pretty quickly uh, as, you, as you have people streaming music. But uh, Great, but uh, yeah, moving on from Groove Shark, uh, there's a story coming out of China this week, uh, which allows us to kind of uh, chat a little bit about the Chinese market. Uh, and it's uh, about the Alibaba-owned Chinese retail destination Taobao, uh, which acquired a streaming uh, music service uh, uh, Xiaomi uh, uh, back in January. And they've actually uh, pretty quickly integrated the, that into their own website. Uh, and the next web reported that uh, it's now added a music function where you can actually uh, listen to music in the background while you continue shopping on, on the site and browsing. So, uh, you know, uh, another retail destination that, uh, just like Amazon in the States, is trying to uh, become more than just a retail destination and become a social destination and a content uh, exploration uh, uh, place as well. So uh, exciting to see like a legal uh, you know, a, a service that is actually aiming to, to, to create some revenue. Uh, 
be acquired and be uh, redeployed. Uh, but uh, does that give you hope uh, towards you know the future of the music uh, mu industry in China? I know that the only figures I could find were that in 2011 the recorded music market generated about 67 million dollars in revenues. Uh, so a lot of room for growth over there. Uh, but uh, still, there there's not a huge amount of support uh, on the government front, uh, um, as far as I know. So um, uh, uh, Ben, any any thoughts on China and what's going to happen in the next year or so? Well, I don't know anything about this particular service, yeah. um, but I mean, China is just a fascinating subject, I, I think. And um, for so long, um, you know, China and a lot of other areas um, in Asia and also in um, in Africa and, and South America were just considered just ruined markets. Uh, you know, just ruined by piracy. You can't you can't sell anything. Um, I, I think there's there's a lot of promise with services like this. And I mean, you can believe that every you know every uh, RDO and and Spotify and everybody else um, is looking at China and India and wants to be there. Yeah. Um, and you know, iTunes launched in, in India. Um, I haven't heard much about how they're doing. Um, I have heard that uh, iTunes in Russia is doing um, quite well. Surprisingly, so I think that must be you know a sign to everybody that these markets that used to just sort of symbolize piracy and how piracy can just decimate music sales, um, they're not necessarily dead. You know, there there could be life in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy, uh, did, did, have you covered anything uh, uh, recently or in the last year out of China on CMU? Uh, we certainly. I mean. We, when there is something to cover, we do sure. cover it. Um, of course. But, uh, have you seen? Have you seen much movement? That's that's what I meant, I guess. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there there, there have been like things that have happened in the last couple of years that that have kind of given hope that China might be a, you know a market that can be cracked um, because obviously there's a lot of people there, and uh, uh, if it was possible to break in there and, and launch services that made money for Western artists, then that is uh, that's a good thing for them. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's it's a, it's, a, it's also a, a market that is very different and needs to be properly understood. And I, I think that's possibly the harder part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Is actually knowing how to sell stuff. There. Yeah, that's right. And I, I really want to have an update with uh, the guys from Music Dish and eighty eight DC eighty eight, which are two companies that operate. Uh, uh, in China and, and in, in the Chinese market to, uh, to s sort of see where how things are, are, are looking uh, in the past sort of uh, 12, 18 months and whether there's a, there's a positive outlook for, for those markets as well. Uh, Elliot, did, 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 have you had any contact with the Chinese startups or companies that are operating in that territory? Not really. Um, in fact, no. I guess I could be more specific. Yeah. Uh, but I, I have a couple observations here. Um, I think that in this leap from um, you know, in the, the difference between CDs and downloads maybe wasn't big enough to change behaviors yeah. um, in some of these more piracy-friendly places. Um, but I think streaming, you know, first of all, you can, you can know exactly where somebody is when you're streaming to them, and, you know, as opposed to a CD, which just kind of goes anywhere, or a download. Um, so that's, that's one, you know, positive uh, checkbox, I guess, that gets checked off. And then um, it's also just a different behavior, you know, if someone's shopping and they can just turn on a thing to hear music, um, that's sort of a different product. It's a more evolved product than, um, than just getting a download. And so it, it's, it's more of a different behavior. I think this is a bigger leap than the one from CDs to MP3s. And um, it, there's a big chance just everywhere in the world to, um, to find out how to make it work. I also like this idea of um, online retailers adding music. It's a huge market, I guess, potentially. Uh, I, it's weird that nobody's really done it before. I mean, sometimes you see a little radio stream, but they could definitely, um, you know, one would assume that it would work the same as brick and mortar, where people stick around if they like the music, or yeah. it puts them in, the, in a frame of mind where they're suddenly going to max out their credit cards or something. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an interesting maneuver, and, and I bet we'll see more of it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I really look forward to seeing what's going to come out of uh, Music Matters as well. Uh, you know, the, the uh, music conference that is going to happen in Singapore, I think, uh, just four weeks' time. So uh, there's going to be some, uh, I'm sure there's going to be some some stats on what's happening uh, in, in Asia uh, coming out of there, uh, and probably China as well. And uh, Ben, I just wanted to talk about a story that you published on, on the New York Times website, which was uh, really interesting, on uh, 
uh, the company Royalty Exchange. Uh, so I just wanted to let you sort of, uh, would you mind give, giving us just a couple of uh, key points on, on what the company does? And uh, I'll, I'll put some uh, links in the show notes uh, so that people can actually check out your entire piece. Okay, um, it's a new company that lets uh, musicians, particularly songwriters, sell part of their royalty streams sort of as a, um, as a security. Um, they're careful not to call it a security and they're not regulated by the SEC. Um, but the idea is that, hey you investor, um, it might be cool for you to um, buy into somebody's royalties. So what, what they're doing mostly now is um, the performing rights um, on the writer's share. This gets into the complications of music publishing. Yeah. Um, but in, in, in other words, it's a sort of fraction of a fraction of all of the royalty streams that are out there uh, for a song that uh, if a songwriter controls it, he can say, all right, I'm going to give you 25% um, of whatever I earn in the future. Um, and these go up as an, as an auction. Um, and uh, you know they've, they've, they've started doing this. It's been interesting because a lot of songwriters are people whose names you don't recognize and faces you don't know, but, but they may have written gigantic hit songs that actually have provided steady revenue for decades. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you wrote a hit song for Whitney Houston, you have been making money. You know? um, the, the tricky thing is that um, the whole idea of royalties, a sort of entertainment royalties as a security has a really rocky history. Uh, in the 90s, David Bowie sold bonds uh, on his royalties, worked out well for him. He raised $55 million, but it was kind of a debacle. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as anybody knows who covers the music business or works in the music business, royalties are a really tricky thing. And there's all kinds of ways in which a slight change to the law or um, just new habits, you know, online can just totally disrupt um, the royalty streams that otherwise look steady. So um, I, I think this company has an interesting idea um, and it could work out for both the musicians who want to raise money and for investors who think it's cool to, you know, spend a hundred grand on buying, uh, you know, 10% uh, of, of, a, of a Natalie Cole song or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts about the whole thing. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, emotional decisions involved in buying pieces of a song where, you know, rather than sort of a, a more uh, squarely sort of uh, financial view of when you're buying a, a stock or, or you know, uh, shares in, in a company. Uh, so, uh, Andy, have you, had you heard about this company before and, and do you uh, like the idea of being able to buy 5% <laughs> of uh, a track? Uh, no, I hadn't actually heard about it until I read uh, Ben's piece, which is really interesting. Um, I, I don't know how I, I don't know, it's a weird, like, in, in it kind of, like you say, it, it makes sense to, yeah. you know, because you own a thing, you need money, you sell a bit of that thing, that makes perfect sense. But then at the same time, it's a song. Also, I mean, as a songwriter, you're kind of taking a gamble already on the, just the future of that song. When you, yeah. when you write it, you're kind of assuming that that's going to be your pension almost. Uh, yeah. And uh, selling off bits of it to make money now, I don't know whether, I don't know, I need to think about it more. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you think about it, this is, this is what, you know, the big music companies do all the time. They buy and sell these gigantic libraries of copyrights. Um, and, you know, this is a way for um, the Joe Schmoes of the music industry um, to sort of do the same thing. Um, but, the, you know, one of the, the things is here that if you're Sony and you're buying or selling half a million copyrights, um, you know, that's a, that's a business deal that, um, that you can manage the risk for, you know, some of the songs might be hits, some of them might not be hits. But if this is your life's work, um, and the way it usually works with songwriters is um, you have a publisher, and whenever the song, say, gets played on the radio, the publisher gets a penny, and you get a penny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and those checks are sort of two separate checks. Um, sales are a whole other thing too, but but basically what it means is that uh, something that has been um, relatively secure, so that if you you know if you wrote that hit song twenty years ago, you're going to get the checks from ASCAP, um, and now you're sort of gambling with um, that you know that stream itself, your income, your you know your pension. Yeah. So I guess I guess it becomes a question of. If you are sort of a, 
a songwriter that has maybe you're already in your 60s and you want to you know get some more retirement money you know the income maybe you're getting from the track is not enough to fund uh, you know whatever you know you want to buy a house somewhere else or anything like that then it might make sense to to do that or you want to put your kids through college yeah you know? yeah exactly so that it might be a way to get almost like a a no interest loan uh, that you repay over the course of a lifetime of the copyright uh by giving away part of it, but it's interesting. I mean, uh, Elliot, I don't, I don't know what your take is, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about how actually few songwriters would be in the position to actually be able to trade this commodity, though, because so so many of them mm -hmm. are are very much tied to a publisher, especially if they've had a track that has had traction or has been a hit. This is true. Um, the the whole thing of who owns a song. I, I uh, you know, many years ago, I took uh, some type of music industry class um, when I just got to San Francisco in like 1996. And the first thing that the copyright lawyer who taught the class said was, um, you know, that copyright, one reason, one way to understand how messed up and confused is, is that there's 200% of every song. Yeah. <laughs> so right there, that, that seems to already start, uh, you know, stop making sense. Uh, the, the two things that spring to mind about this for me are, are I hope that it doesn't turn into like the new pawning your saxophone or something, you know, people in the, in the grips of a temporary need for cash could make some rash decisions that would affect their futures. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I think this would make a great present. I mean, I, I think this, this sort of weird little secret of iTunes is that I don't know what percentage, but I have a feeling it could be as much as half of the music on, sold on iTunes is a gift. You know, those gift cards, parents who, um, who buy their kid an iPod and they, and they want to raise, you know, a, a good conscious person. So they give them a gift card in the hopes that they don't turn to BitTorrent or something. So um, I think, you know, that, that would make a great present that, you know, you can, you can buy somebody the naming rights to a star. There are all these weird presents like that. And um, to give somebody a percentage of their favorite song would make a fantastic thing. I, I just, yeah. I wonder whether the things could scale enough that you could ever find a song that you know, um, or whether it's going to be kind of haphazard um, in terms of which musicians participate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, absolutely, I, I would encourage everybody to go and check out uh, Ben's piece as well. Of, uh, as I said, I'll put the links in the show notes so you can you can go read it, uh, read it for yourself. And uh, um, there were actually uh, two interesting records that came out uh, last week, and one was tied to Spotify and the other was tied to YouTube. So uh, we talked about the Daft Punk uh, track, get the track Get Lucky, and uh, Spotify actually uh, ta announced or, or touted it as the uh, you know the track that had the most streams on on the day of, of release for for a single, uh, so that was quite an interesting uh, interesting uh, bit of news. And mm -hmm. on the other side, you have Size uh, Gentleman, which is the follow up to Gangnam Style, uh, which uh, has already hit. I think uh, I think we're at about two hundred and twenty million views in just about ten uh, ten and a half days or so. Um, uh, at the time of recording, and uh, it also had the highest number of views in one day. I think with uh, uh, twenty eight million or some something along those lines. Um, and but it's interesting because it kind of puts uh, shows you like a duality between you know the Spotify uh, black box you know they they said this was the highest uh, number of streams I've ever done but they didn't say at all or not even a region of how many those were and YouTube that has always been very transparent in exactly how many views a track gets and 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 how that works uh, so so how do you f um, how do you see Spotify evolving in terms of how they share the figures on on streams for example because that can be a very significant uh, uh, benchmark going forward uh, for for uh, artists' achievements, and uh, and how do you compare that to YouTube's complete transparency, uh, in in and brutal transparency in terms of how many people have actually watched uh, watched the video? Um, uh, Elliot, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I I don't know. I, I think I don't I don't think we're going to see Spotify suddenly start um, pulling YouTube and putting these you know attaching numbers um, to each of the tracks. Um, I don't know what, it, what they would gain by that. I'm sure the numbers aren't as high as uh, as YouTube's, which are just obscenely ridiculous. I mean, every time Psy does anything, yeah. um, it's just it, the mind boggles. And, and every, uh, every YouTube hit um, breaks a new record. You know, these numbers are just going in one direction. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a little bit... I wonder if sometimes if Google wishes they hadn't done that um, because... You know, if you're Psy or his label, you can sort of see how much how much you would have made if, if the 
on Spotify, yeah. um, and and YouTube makes it very clear. Um, and you know, I, I did the math on how much Sai made from having the most popular um, video ever on YouTube, and most of the popular videos on YouTube are music. Yeah. Um, so it really is a music service, and I, I forget the exact number. I think it was like four million dollars. So that's the absolute high end best case scenario for YouTube monetization. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, it sounds like a lot of money, but when you, when you compare it to, um, you know, other, other benchmarks, it's the per, the per play is, is a lot lower. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, it seems like Google's sort of painting itself in a corner. And I actually think this is why, uh, they're, you know, there's these rumors that Google's going to watch subscription service. And my theory is that the labels are making them do it. Um, and there was an interesting quote from someone at YouTube saying, you know, some of our content partners are really, really interested in this other kind of model. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's those those massive millions and millions, you know, those those huge digits under side videos and, and other popular ones that probably have people at the labels going like, wait, this is money escaping. Um, and, and I think this is why we're going to see a subscription from Google. Yeah. That's right. Uh, ben, do you reckon that Spotify uh, is worried about releasing actual numbers because they don't want people to actually, you know, count their change and sort of uh, start trying to work out exactly how much money somebody w w is supposed to be getting from a specific number of streams? I don't think it's Spotify that's worried. I think it's the labels. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you, you use the word transparency. Um, you know, that's a really critical one just in, in the music business generally. And um, you, you, you said that um, YouTube is totally transparent. I'm not sure I agree with that. I well, mean, there, yeah. there, is the, <laughs> there is a play count there, and, and that, yeah. that is something that's very important. But what happens within the gears? Um, you know, what are the rights? Who gets the money? You know, it was shocking to me um, that even just about a year ago, um, there was a post by a music publisher named Matt Pincus, who runs a, uh, a small um, but, but growing uh, publishing company, who said that most publishers are not getting a dime. Yeah. Um, from from YouTube and you know over the last couple of years there's sort of been you know the publishers put out a press release like every six months where they talk about this groundbreaking new deal with YouTube to uh, to pay publishers and so you gotta wonder well what have they been doing all this time all these yeah. billions of views um, so you know there's there's a lot of um, competing interests here and uh, you know generally entrenched music industry um, just does not want people to see their books. They do not want people, especially the artists and their managers, to know exactly how it works. Uh, and when they get audited or when they get sued, the usual thing is just write them a check and, uh, and tell them to go away. Yeah. So, you know, it, I mean, yeah, I think it's true to an extent that Spotify's numbers aren't as necessarily amazing all the time, but they're going to grow. Yeah. I, I think the real problem is that uh, you know, the, the, the music industry um, doesn't want them to open their books. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I mean, uh, Andy, I guess the only, the only place where you can really get some sort of sense of what's happening on the streaming front are there's a streaming chart on Billboard and there's also, uh, which is actually powered by the next big sound, if, if I'm, uh, as far as I'm aware, if I'm correct on that. Um, and so I guess that's one of the only places where you can actually gauge how much traction each track is having on a specific, uh, uh, well, not a specific, on all streaming services uh, sort of uh, gathered together. Uh, would you like to see more transparency from Spotify and audio and 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 these are on the actual play counts? Uh, well, yeah, I guess yeah, it would be interesting because obviously on the on the kind of the download and physical side, you know, every week we get a chart where we get exact figures. Yeah. Um, and you can see kind of exactly how well something's doing, and you could, and you can see. I mean, what you get is you can see the weeks when something goes to number one, and you're surprised, and then you look and see that actually, yeah, you know, overall it sold half what people sell on average every you know on the usual week. Um, and and uh, but then the chart has really established itself been around for a long time. Spotify is growing, and it wants people to think it's, you know really big deal and then if you know if they release figures and and you can see that actually not that many people at all streamed 
that Daft Punk song. Or, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people did, <laughs> sure but not, you know, kind of yeah, comparatively. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just leaves you wondering, like, how many are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is obviously, like, with, uh, with, with Sight, it's kind of this mind-blowing thing where, like, every day you turn on a computer and it's like, oh, yeah, he's, you know, everyone in the world has watched it twice again. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, a, you know, it's a fascinating thing. It's obviously, it would be fascinating to, to get numbers from the streaming services, but I just, uh, yeah, like, I, I don't think it's something we're going to see. Yeah. For the, you know, and, until they become, until streaming services become a much more established Absolutely. thing. Uh, great. Well, thanks so much, guys. I think I'm going to wrap this up because uh, you know we've been uh, going for almost an hour now. But uh, I just wanted to uh, do the usual uh, round and see if there's anything that you'd like to plug. And if not, just you can just mention your website or your or Twitter account. Uh, so, uh, Ben. Uh, Thanks for having me on the show um, with these distinguished gentlemen. I really enjoyed everything we talked about. Um, I'll plug both of them, CMU and Evolver FM. I think you guys do a fantastic job, and I read them all the time. So Great. Awesome. Well, it's uh, uh, it's uh, there's a lot of Thanks. love going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> but well, also check also uh, check Media Decoder uh, on the New York Times website. It's a, it's a great it's a great blog and lots of really interesting articles. Uh, Andy. Well, if, you know, if that's the way we're going, I, I read Ben stuff and the Evolver of him stuff all the time as well. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the best actress <laughs> award on the Oscars. <laughs> but I do also have something to plug. So. Yeah, you've got the Great Escape coming up, right? We have got the Great Escape coming up next month, which uh, we program the convention side of that. And we're just putting the finishing touches on the program at the moment. And Great. it's going to be really exciting. So come to awesome. Brighton in May, everyone. Yeah. That should be there for at least a day. Fingers okay. crossed. Awesome. And, and uh, I'll mention... I will mention my brother's band, which I talk about, but <laughs> Javelin. Their new record, High Beams, just dropped. Um, Pitchfork sort of had the wrong guy write about it and wrote a savage review that was completely an outlier from the rest of the internet. They had the hip hop guy um, review it, and it's not a hip hop album. Oh, nice. Um, I guess it's because they've, they've done stuff with samples before that they, they had the hip hop guy do it. But um, anyway, <laughs> it's a fantastic. Uh, album and it's it's what the Beatles would sound like if today if they'd never broken up. That's oh my wow, that's uh, that's quite a statement there. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll, we're going to have to go and check it out ju just just to see what it sounds like now. <laughs> great. Well, thanks so much and uh, have a great week. And I'm, I hope to have you on the show back soon. Thanks for listening to Digital Music Trends and remember to check out the DMT One to One Show on DigitalMusicTrends.com.